Um, greeting everyone and welcome to those who've just joined us and uh, thanks to everyone, particularly the students who've stayed with us um, in the load shedding challenges. Our talk today is on the origin or, or our talk now is on the origin and development of the West Coast Marine Diamond Places of Southern Africa. And John Ward is going to deliver it and importantly he's going to cover the 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 the, the the, the real big placer in Namibia, and he's also importantly going to um, discuss the, the mega placer in, in South Africa to the south. Um, just by way of quick background, John holds a doctorate in geology from the University of KZN and has worked in about 26 countries, 20 of which were in Africa, mainly on alluvial and kimberlite diamond projects, ranging from greenfield exploration through to large scale mine production operations. He's also done a tremendous amount of work on the alluvial sector and our West Coast um, placer deposits. So over to you, John, thanks. Thanks very much, John. And uh, good day to everyone out there. The presentation today is actually a joint one with uh, Mike DeWitt. Many of you know him and have already heard him. So um, what we're going to present today is is the definition and understanding of a mega placer, diamond mega placer globally. And uh, what I'll run through is you know, just some of the definitions of that. Is a source to sink model that we really need to appreciate. And then we'll look, look briefly into the two uh, mega placers that Southern Africa is privileged to, to, to host, actually. And that's the Mesozoic to Cenozoic Namakulan Mega Plaza. It's a little bit older than the Cenozoic Spurkebeet Plaza, which is in Namibia, mostly in Namibia, a little portion in South Africa. The Namakulan Plaza falls totally in South Africa. And then we'll end with a few considerations. But before I kick off, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting us to share this with us. We haven't uh, really dealt with the Namakulan Mega Plaza in any of the uh, forums in the past. And so that'll be some, some new info there. It's a very biased info because it's obviously based on what Mike and I have worked on in the past. And, um, and I also want to pay really due acknowledgement to the many geos and, and fieldies who've worked out there along the West Coast, both the, the big companies and the juniors and the, and the individuals who've very kindly shared their various expertises and views and, and opinions on the West Coast. It's been going for a long time. It's been known since the early 1900s. And so it's not exactly a, a, a new part of the part of the uh, Plaza story, but um, and and in particular, I'd like to to just pay a bit of tribute to the late Professor Brian Bluck, who actually imparted a lot of scientific rigor into our exploration efforts in the in the 1990s and, and early 2000s. So with that, I'm going to kick off with some definitions, just where where, where the uh, Plazas lie in Southern Africa. The Spurkebeet Mega Placer, the younger one, is lies just south of the Orange River outfall into the Atlantic Ocean, northwards along the Namibian coast for nearly a thousand kilometers up into the skeleton coast of Namibia. It's a really tremendous placer. And this one is, is probably the, the world's or the globe, globally the biggest diamond gem placer in the world in the world. To the south of it is the older, smaller. Namakwalan Mega Plaza, and both of them, as you can see, are in the littoral sect. They're in the coastal sect of, of, of the west coast of Southern Africa. What makes them Mega Plazas? Well, our definition of that in, back in 2005 was, was you, you had to have at least 50 million carats in your Plaza pocket, and you needed to have that pocket filled with gem diamonds, not with bought in industrial and rejections. You needed 95% plus gem quality to qualify into the top league of a diamond mega placer. That's quite a tall order. Uh, Mike has felt that we might have to revise that 95% cutoff in terms of the, the standard on the, on the quality of diamonds. But for the interim, these two mega placers in Southern Africa actually stand out in the world. There are no others that touch them. Okay, what's a, what's a definition, just a brief definition of a placer itself. It's really just a mechanical concentration of heavy minerals. And uh, you see here some heavy mineral concentrations on a, on a beach. 
We have some of the garnets and magnetite. Our heavy minerals, obviously smaller than diamonds. These are sand size. But our pebbles are mostly diamonds and where they concentrate by, by mostly by, mostly by, by mechanical processes, then we get the development of a placer. The interesting thing about diamonds is that ESG is not particularly high. You know, it's not a tin or a, or a gold story at all. It's 3.5, 3.52, but they have also a, a wettability issue. Diamonds are hydrophobic, they don't like water, and they uh, that, that might make them a, an interesting uh, piece of the pebble history when you're trying to develop a placer. Nobody's really done any work on that, but it's certainly, certainly something to bear in mind when you think about the, the small pebbles associated with larger gravels in most of the placers of the world, diamond placers, that is. Tanya's already dealt with the, the upgrade, the very rapid upgrade, so I'm not going to really dwell on this one. Um, She's highlighted the, the work that we did at Letseng up, at the, up in the Maluti Mountains in Lesotho. And very quickly, within a couple of hundred meters to half a kilometer away from, from a primary source, you get a, a rapid upgrade in your diamond quality. So that's something important. So how about a cartoon then of, of what we're trying to get, get at and what we're trying to get to? <clears throat> and I'm going to specifically look at this in terms of the African Kraton, in terms of the African placer context. So the principal alluvial diamond placers that we recognize in, in Africa, and we depict it here in this source to sink cartoon, is that you need a source. And as we all have heard on the course, Kratons really are your are your good and major sources of, of, of diamonds in terms of the primary sources coming up in the cratons, they tend to be the most fertile, although the, the margins can also hold, hold and host um, uh, kimberlites. Um, but basically, you need a source for your diamonds, and the cratons really are. Most of our cratons in Africa, anyway, have been pretty much planed off. They're, they're, they're obviously ancient, ancient bodies, 2.6 billion and older, and they've been hammered a few times by a number of erosional events. So they tend to be subdued topography. We don't have great topography in our, in our African cratons. Usually where you find it, it's a greenstone belt that stick up, for example, in Zimbabwe. And so it's in this, that's in the source area, we have what we call the proximal reach places. In other words, the places that are close to the source. And from there, drainage in particular, use usually rivers that then remove the, uh, the diamonds, as along with just natural erosion, back down to what could be lower topographic entities. And the, and the main one is obviously the sea, down at zero meters above sea level. And what's interesting about cratons is they tend to be slightly buoyant. They're slightly lighter than the, than the rest. They've been depleted. So they tend to be a little bit buoyant and bob up and down, mostly bobbing up a little bit. And therefore, the drainage comes off a craton pretty much. When it does, it goes through the orogenic belts. They tend to weld our cratons together and tend to, to, to surround the cratons. And um, so we get drainage going through, usually a bit of mountainous terrain uh, around the edge of the craton, looking for the, the sink, which is invariably the, the sea is the main one, the, the various oceans. And when you get down onto the coastal plain, you're then dealing with the littoral tract itself. So basically you have proximal reach places close to the source. You have then what we call transient places or mid-reach places, which are running through the mountain belt, trying to get down to that sink area. And then once you get down towards the, 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 the sink area itself, then we tend to have our terminal places. So what we'll do now is have a quick squiz at, the, at some examples of these, these places, because on the craton, we recognize retained places. Those are the places that are held on the craton or unable to get off. We have transient places, which are trying to, which are moving the diamonds in this particular case off the craton. Once you come through the orogenic belt, everybody's in, or the, the sedimentological processes are in, are in action as it were. And we're, we consider this to be transient places, in other words, in, in transit to somewhere else. And when we get down onto the coastal plain, we, we finally end up with, with terminal places. So let's have a look at some examples in the field. Well, probably the, the closest you can get to a retained cluster is actually inside the, the crater of a kimberlite itself. 
And there's some extremely good examples, as we've heard from Herman Kutter and, and others up in Angola. And here we have the, uh, the side, the marginal, very coarse breach of the Katoka pipe and down into the central, er central areas. And so this would represent the talus and coarse talus slopes breaking away from the edge of your pipe. And as you get down into the finer grain part of the, the um, pipe itself, you get, you get your lacustrinal type, type basinal sediments, fine grain sediments in there. But so obviously inside a kimberlite, very difficult to, to build up a mega placer in the sense of diamond um, quality, but you certainly can build up big concentrations of, of uh, resedimented diamonds down, down these slopes and, and into the, back into the, into the pipe itself. The other, as I mentioned, you know, many of the, most of the cratons have been eroded many times. And the very good example of, of this is in, is in um, the Northwest province of South Africa, where we have a carbonate platform over the top of this erosional surface of Transvaal supergroup, trans, trans, Transvaal sediments, which are mostly carbonates in, in places, big, big areas, big tracks of carbonates, uh, dolomites and, 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 and such like. And they tend to to be dissolved over time because obviously they get exposed and, and you get the solution of the, of the carbonates to give you sinkholes. And um, here is an example of Pinos pothole, over 550 odd thousand carats or so came out of here and, um, and still, still holding uh, diamonds in them. And there's been lots of work and speculation done on it. Tanya did a lot of work on these um, sinkholes and cast topography in the Fentersdorp area and very, very close to Luchtenberg. And here on the right-hand side, you see a sinkhole that is actually, a, 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 was a virgin one that was found. It was actually found on the work that Mike David did, Mike, uh, Mike did in, the, in the 1970s when he was working for the survey. And he and Ed, Edgar Stettler were doing the geophysical surveys. And one of the diggers followed up on, on, a, on his master's thesis and actually found an in situ retained placer on the craton over here. And the, and the grades were, were, were extremely good. They matched what Alex de Toy described in 1951, about 80-odd carats per 100 ton. The other, the other way that we could hold uh, uh, seds on, on a craton is to shovel them or keep them, retain them in a, an intracratonic basin, such as the Colonda Formation. And again, Tanya has covered this extremely well. So we'll just mention it here and, and just show the, the cartoon sketch that that is sometimes used to depict these kimberlites coming up, being tapped in the Cretaceous, and particularly in Angola, being tapped by the Colonda Formation, draining away from there, and then subsequently being co covered and buried uh, until the younger incision and rivers open up of the modern drainage system, then tap into this and, and uh, bring your sediments from the intracratonic set setting into modern drainages. So, okay, so that's, that sort of sums up really the, the, the craton setting, our primary sources, proximal reach places. There's a, and as one goes through tapping off here, the, the places are transient and they, and they and likewise on the, on the uh, proximal reach, they, they tend not to, be able, not to be able to build up, you know, 50, 100 million odd carats of gem quality stones. So here's an example, good one on the, uh, we have the Vol and the Reach Rivers in, in um, South Africa. Lyndon speak about that. And what we find is that the river terraces that are preserved here tend to be just aggradational sequences, cutoff sequences of the river. So it's the scale of the river that's preserved and not any major um, really big deposits over there. So these are the the transient classes coming off the craton and heading on to through the or orogenic belts. So finally, we get down onto the coastal plain itself into the littoral tract, and this is where we get our, our terminal classes. And <clears throat> here's a view of the, the Orange River mouth down on the West Atlantic coast, west coast of Southern Africa, and it forms a border between Namibia to the north, South Africa to the south, and what's very noticeable here is a, is a real high energy wave breaking zone about 500 meters wide over here. And there's no delta to this river. So although there's lots of sediment around, you can see there's no delta. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for, 
for a, a, a fluvial conduit that's carrying your diamonds to get down to your terminal placer, and that terminal placer has high energy in it. You put a delta out here, you just sink all your stones away, and it'd be very difficult to get to them. And it's the marine action, that constant marine action, the tidal action, the wind action on, onto that, that is very important. And that's what generates really significant gem quality places, is, is, is the marine setting over here. So what do you need then to make a mega placer? You know, just, just in summary, you know, we had a look at it from source to sink in a cartoon form. Here's another sort of cartoon summary of it. Well, on that craton, you need to have plenty of diamondiferous material, you know, preferably a long history of kimberlite intrusions, diamondiferous kimberlites, that is, in, in pulses, a minimum loss by erosion, and then repeated reworking and upgrading by some of those um, intracratonic processes like the colander formation. So you, you, want, a, you want a craton that's, um, that's, you know, got a lot of diamonds on it preferably accumulated over time. And then you want to have a drainage basin on that craton that covers quite a big percentage of that craton and allows, and it has a, an outfall that gets itself down to the sink, preferably already organized down to the sink before you activate this drainage basin to actually then start stripping off the, the material that is accumulated on, on, your, on the craton. And, um, you know, it's nice to have a steep incision tract between down through the transient placers because you want to move those, those stones down to towards your terminal placer. And you don't want to sort of hang them up in little bib, bibs and bobs along the, along the route, although this does happen. And uh, these are the transient placers at the mid, middle orange and uh, down to sort of Prisca and very small deposits that are left in the Uppington Carcamus area of of the Namaqua metamorphic complex, one of the orogenic belts that goes around, wraps around the carpal craton on the west. And then finally, you get down to your terminal placer. So once you get it onto the coast, as I mentioned, you don't really want to dump it into a, into a delta. Now, a delta isn't going to help you much because it's just going to hide everything. So you want it in a terminal placer where you've got high, high enough energy to separate out your sediments. In other words, it's bringing down whatever it brings down. You want that marine environment to be able to have sufficient energy to separate out the, out the, the pieces of, of sediment into their respective class sizes. You want to be able to, it's very advantageous to have a drift system superimposed on that, which then takes away a lot of your finer material because your diamonds aren't going to be sitting in that. They're going to be sitting with your pebble fraction and you want to be able to segregate that, move, move, move them out. And your shelf, that it, that it debouches onto should also be preferably neutri neutrally buoyant. You don't want it subsiding all the time, then locking up and putting all your, all your sediment into a basin where it can't be reworked. So a neutrally, neutrally buoyant shelf, which is um, able to, to then sustain a, a, an approximate even level while the sea level, by the eustatic changes, in other words, those those um, sea level changes driven by, driven by our, our glacials and non-glacials in particular, uh, are able to rework and rake that shelf and upgrade it and rake it and separate out the sediments and, and upgrade. That's, that's what you're looking for. And you, you need those sea level changes on that sea level shelf. You want that over some sort of form of geological time to be able to, to, to build up a terminal plaster. And once you've got those conditions in place, then you have a good opportunity to build up a diamond mega placer. And obviously our mega placer model has been based on the West Coast placers of, of Southern Africa, namely the, the Makalan mega placer, but in particular the Spurgebiet, the Namibian Spurgebiet mega placer. And what we'll do now is run through those two placers and have a look at the differences and how they've come about and what's, what's made them so special in a global sense. So just back to this, let's just Re refresh ourselves where we are. Here's our Namakulan mega placer, somewhat laterally restricted to the coast of Namakulan itself, just south of the Ulifans River, Bumbles Bay area, northwards all the way up to, to um, just north of Port Nolif, Cliffs area, up here. So a couple of hundred kilometers over here, whereas the Spurkebiet, the younger placer, which is built up during the Cenozoic, 
is a, is a much bigger beast and it uh, has a slight, somewhat different history to it. But let's, let's kick off with another view as well. Another, another uh, principle that we need to understand is that if this is our carb vol interior source over here, my diamonds and sediment is moving down to the coast, then usually what we find sedimentologically is that your bigger stones are closer to the source and your smaller stones are, are further away from your source into your distal areas. And we see this clearly in our di diamonds. If you have a look at the diamonds that, that come out of the Vol and Middle Orange area rivers in particular, they, they tend to be quite big. And then as you go down towards the coast, there's a 50 odd character over here, you get down to your, you know, and for scale, you get down to your half characters and 0.25s quarter carat stones. And this is an interesting situation that we'll, we'll just touch on later in the Swerkebeek Placer because there is a, a little twist to that scorpion tail in, the, in, the, in that desert. Right, so let's, what are the starting differences then between the two diamond mega coast placers? You know, they both come from the same crater. And what has happened to, to the evolution and the development in this post Gondwana breakup time. First of all, the Namakulan placer down here, it's older, it has a Cretaceous origin, Mesozoic origin, whereas the Spurkebeet is a younger Cenozoic origin, you know that. It's laterally restricted on the west coast, as I mentioned, whereas in compared to the long tail of the Spurkebeet placer. But I think what's one of the real significant geological, sedimentological differences that, that we need to know is that the Namakulan placer is really a ligamectic. It's dominated by quartz. It has zircon in it, and it also has, has obviously the diamonds. <clears throat> but it really is a, a, it tends to be an oligomictic, in other words, a one a one class type placer in, in that eventually. And that I think reflects the nature of the development of this, this placer over the over the years. In contrast, the spurkebeet is, is polymictic, it has Resistate, they both of them, no, no, no mistake about it, they resistate class that, are, that make up the placer. But the, the Spurkebeet placer has a, a variety of, of class. It has agates, it has quartz, it has chalcedonies, epidocytes, jaspers, bandoline formation, resistate class, but certainly a nice assemblage. And that assemblage we may, we've been able to track back into the interior of Southern Africa, onto the carp hole, and been able to identify the input points on the, from that, um, uh, from, from the stratigraphy on the interior. Okay, the background that we're looking at here is a, is a SRTM image, and that red line is going to be significant because that's a 570 meter contour, and uh, it's a fairly, it's fairly recent work, the last four or five years, by a colleague of ours, Roger Swart, based in Namibia, and uh, he's done a lot of work in, in recognizing a Late Cretaceous shoreline that comes up to about 570 meters all the way along our coast from southern Angola down into the to the Western Cape. And that's a key for, for a new key in, in recent years that helps us define where we are with these places. This is more of Rogers from Rogers um, SRTM type work. And the two com continuing with the two comparisons, what's interesting is that. Mike's work, Mike's uh, thesis, PhD thesis on the Karoo River and Kalahari River, but in particular the Karoo River being an outfall into the southern Namakulan coast is backed up by the delta, the sand dominated delta, which was recognized by Sukho and, um, and, and dated around about 120 to 100 million years ago. So in other words, it's a sand dominated delta down there and uh, there's abundant wood associated with it. Ian Stevenson and Marion Bamford did work on that. And it, it could equally be not necessarily a forest out there, but, but it represents the debouching of a big river coming from the interior of South Africa during wetter times, those Cretaceous, early Cretaceous wetter times. And um, so that is the first hint of an age that helps us with an age over here. And we've certainly got Credit uh, diamond uh, deposits along the line here. Most of them reworked, granted into younger deposits today, but certainly it's something to bear in mind over here. So we've got a, a cutoff of about 100 million years, and that's important because the Kimberley 
population or that late Cretaceous group one Kimberley population is mostly 85 to 95 million year intrusions. And we don't see those stones in the Namakoland Plaza. We see smaller stone sizes, we see whiter, cleaner stones down here. We don't see that, that, big, that coarser diamond population in Namakoland. But opposite the Orange River, somewhat younger than this, this Kuru River then switches off and we see a mud dominated delta developed in the Kudu. And these two deltas have given us an ice broad shelf over here, which is one of the criteria that we might want to have for developing mega plasters. But what's interesting is that the coarseness of this Orange River, the Kudu Delta is such that you're not getting coarse material coming to the coast. It's a mud dominated. It, it's telling us it's different to the situation back in, in off the Macquarie coast. All right, so there's just a little summary there. And um, what is important is that the, the dates on the diamonds from here, particularly by the work of Dave Phillips and his co-workers show that we are looking at the pre-Kimberley population, group two Kimberlites, the 110 and older, 150 odd million years, the intra karoo ages, those that are there between 230 and 250 odd, and then some of the pre dwyker pre karoo pre ages coming out of, out of Namakwalad. Right. So if we look at the Namakwalad coastal plain itself, it's, it's a pretty uh, sort of subdued sand covered feature, and there's not a heck of a lot to see of it. But what has happened is that there's been some nice regional uh, geophysical surveys done over it, and they've recognized deeply buried bedrock structural, structurally controlled valleys that lie to the west and on the coastal plain. So here's the red is the 570 meter. Down at the bottom, there's a, another bottom of the escarpment sits at 170 odd meters. And then to the west of that 170 odd meters is where we've seen the development of these valleys. They've been drilled, they've been tested, they're diamond bearing, and some of them are very, very rich, particularly down this part of the world, close to the, out, the uh, current Swartlinkies River, what they call Konyas area. And we've got some, some spectacular clay fill channels there that had very, very high grades. Well sorted diamonds, small, these are the smallest diamonds along the coast, 0 0.2 to 0.25 carats a stone average, but extremely well sorted, hardly any big stones in here. And when you look along the Biffles as well, you look at the, there's a proto Biffles river terraces here. Some of the deposits, particularly like Biffles Bank, for 30 years of mining, the, the, as one Asi van der Versailles would tell us, the stone size never went above 0.48. And these are extremely well sorted populations, high grade river terraces here that imply that, we, that they are reworking a pre arranged or pre sorted population. And I think that's, that's a critical view. Here's, here's some a field view of it. The clay channel sitting down here, you can see quite clearly the channel feature over here, the white sharing of kaolinization, yellow as well. And these clay channels really contain zircon, quartz, and, and, and diamonds. They, they are true plasters uh, in that sense. But the intriguing thing is, is that inside those plasters, inside these channels, you not only have some Cretaceous fossils, little microfossils that is, but you also have a pollen flora, a pollen flora that was worked on by Sue de Villiers and Anne Cadman that showed very clearly that it was, that these were Eocene to Oligocene, mostly Oligocene in age. Now that's interesting because they are not totally tertiary channels as we originally thought. These then are tertiary channels that are carrying diamonds and carrying some, some microflora from a Cretaceous deposit, but not in situ anymore. And therefore they represent reworked material coming across the coastal plain at the younger sea levels from the 90 meter, which is Miocene in age, roughly 20, 15, 20 odd million, uh, maybe a bit younger. And then the 50 meter marine, which is a Pliocene terrace, 30 meter marine, which is a Plio Pleistocene marine, transgressions that have come across the coastal plain and preserved, hidden these buried, these buried channels over here. And these, these are all they've done is reworked the material that these channels were taking out onto the shelf, put it back up again. Because by this time, there was no more source coming into the, into the, um, the Macquarie Mega Plaza. And we'll, just a, just a side thing here, the, the, the um, Donax, the white mussels, 
are used on the west coast for zone fossils. The 50 meter marine package is, is uh, defined by Donax Fortini, the 30 meter by this rather coarse Donax Rogers eye over there. So, so we've got some fossils that help tell us where things lie on, on this uh, west coast, coast placer. So just to summarize, don't worry about all the writing on the, on the right hand side, you can read it up yourselves. But essentially there's the red line, the 570 meter, it's a late Cretaceous shoreline, 65 to 70 meters. So it's younger than the, than the delta offshore, the Sukho recognized, the Sukho or Hund Hundeklip sand delta. So what we believe happened here is that Mike's Karoo River got cut off somewhere around about a hundred odd million years ago. And we, that's because there are no Kimberley stones coming down over here. We cut off that base. This river switches to the north. It goes into start feeding the, the Kudu Delta to the north of, of Namaqualand. And on the coastal plain, we have stripping of the old shoreline and remnants of the, of the Cretaceous shoreline that would have reworked the, the, um, the outfall of the, Karoo, of the Karoo River. We have that then reworked down roughly to our 170 meter level, which is the Eocene high stand. When we recognize this high stand in central Namibia, southern Namibia, and the Spurgebiet, the very important one. And then from then on, we have a, a long lived regression, global regression in the Ligocene. It's probably something like seven odd million years. There's a bit of controversy about how far out it went, but certainly that long lived Ligocene regression allowed the stripping of the Eocene shoreline and whatever Cretaceous remnants were left through these buried channels out onto the coastal shelf. And, um, and the, the high grade classes over here are those of Koinos or Tlinkis. We're talking several thousand carats per hundred ton here, so extremely high grade de deposits. And, and, and also the, the river deposits, the younger Miocene ones along the Buffels River, also representing reworking of a well-sorted diamond population with hardly any big stones on it. The bigger stone in the, uh, in the macro land is just over 100 carats, comes out of the mouth of the olifants. And back in 1959, when Daryl Hallam uh, published his paper, Morton's book, the, he pointed out that most of the rivers in the macro land had a coarse diamond population at their mouths, tailing off rather rapidly then kicking up again at each of the mouths. And I think that this really represents the reworking of these older marine places, the Cretaceous one, the Eocene, the early Cenozoic one, and then the reworking, then the Oligocene low, bringing these, these well-sorted populations down to the coast, and then the younger drainages just pushing it up into the, into the Atlantic where the coastal drift, the longshore drift is dominated by your southerly wind system. We'll talk about that more in the Spurgebiet, but we know that this southerly wind system has been going since, since uh, uh, West Gondwana broke up and it was opened up big enough to have a South Atlantic anticyclonic wind system here. And Roger, has, Roger Swart has had good evidence of, of this in the Kudu Delta as have um, Wickens and, and the, the Sukho guys have published on, on the Kudu. So we know that for, this is a long lived southerly wind drift system, and this is what we really see in terms of a summary. So, well, the Macland is, is older. It's input of diamonds in the lower Cretaceous, reworked in the upper Cretaceous, and then reworked again through the, through the Cenozoic without having, adding any more diamonds to, the, to that population that is older than Kimberley. So we have a look at a perspective view, SRTM view into the interior of Southern Africa, Kuruman Hills over there. There's the big Cobb Valley of uh, Alex de Toy coming down. That's occupied by the, by the Orange River, the Royal Orange today. And then coming through. So Mike would have had his Karoo River coming across here, across the deep arching somewhere here on the Knurs Flutter. Here's your Cretaceous Edge shoreline very clearly shown over there with the embayment. And um, you're in the Placer then developed somewhere between 120 and 100 odd million years ago. The river then, for whatever reason, either capture or so whatever shift, then moved north to make our Kudu Delta over here, leaving the Namakoland Placer effectively headless for the last 100 million years, but certainly not diamondless, that's for sure. So, okay, let's, let's now move <clears throat> to the Spurkebeet Mega Placer. This, this is a big Placer. It's probably the world's biggest placer that we've certainly been able to identify. 
so far, over 100 million carats in it at 95% GM quality, and that's recovered carrots, that is, and probably a couple of hundred million to go. Whereas the Namakula and Vega Placer has just about topped 50 million, plus, uh, 50 million carrots, and uh, but at 95% GM. So it's it's there at the, just into the Mega Placer League, as it were, whereas the Spurka beat is very clearly well into the Mega Placer League. So let's, <clears throat> let's take a step into, the, uh, into what happened in the late Cretaceous over here. There's the, there's the shoreline shown in red again, probably the shoreline. And we have the Kudu Delta built out offshore or monument itself. And there were, there were essentially no Cretaceous deposits onshore at or diamondiferous for, the, for this part of the world. And, we, and that's because effectively the river by this stage was very mature. It was a meandering, muddy, muddy river, not bringing down any coarse plastics to the coast at that time. There is one Cretaceous deposit, Wonderfeld 4 onshore, which is about 80 million years, Antonian in age, and that represents a little bit of a transgression at some stage during the accumulation of the, of the Kudu Delta. By the time this transgression takes place, the Kudu Delta is, uh, is, is coming to an end, actually, funny enough, somewhere there 65, 70 million years ago. ago. And that's pretty crucial because then how do you how, how does the Spurka beat then end up being such a, a fantastic placer? Well, here's some of the proxy evidence that we have that the Kudu Delta was fed by a very big river. These are meander loops that you can see here with roughly a 10 kilometer wavelength on it. And these are entrenched today from the Richtersfeld westwards on the coastal plain of Namibia. And this, this these represent superimposed drainages. In other words, you've had uplift, and we, we know that. We know that from our, our offshore records and the truncation offshore that Urban Berger has spoken about or will speak about, is that the truncation in the tertiary is, reflects the uplift of the subcontinent's orogenic uplift. In other words, it's not mountain building. It's an uplift that just jacks up the whole of the subcontinent. And because the Orange River was already feeding the, the Kudu Delta, it meant that we had a major outfall heading to the Atlantic, draining the, the Carfold Craton now with a bit of energy. And this is what we see reflected in here. What's interesting is that a 10 kilometer wavelength means that if you work back into meander belt um, fluvial dynamics, it means that the catchment area needed to be around about a million odd square kilometers. And it's quite interesting because the current orange drainage basin is around about 800 and just 890, just under 900,000 square, square kilometers. And this is looking back at it here. The blue line here represents the Vol Orange catchment itself, including the Fish River in Namibia, which is mostly defunct due to aridity. And in fact, as the aridity developed through the Cenozoic in Southern Africa from 40 odd million years ago through to peaking in the, in the Playa Pleistocene, then these rivers that were tributaries from the northern side basically become defunct until ultimately you're left with the Lesotho Highlands being your water pump for the for the uh, Vol Orange system and the Vol as Dave Helgen pointed out in his book 1975 the river of diamonds is very true so the Vol is is a, is, a, is the main diamond carrier the orange is the water pump today and that comes down onto the coast so the blocks here represent kimberlites the pink outline over here is what we believe to be the Carvel Craton, pretty much. And the yellow dots represent alluvial diamonds. And you can see here are the alluvial diamonds in the northwest province in Lichtenberg that um, Pierre de Jager has spoken, spoken about. And um, Mike has published recently on the Lichtenberg update there. And so we've got ourselves a, 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 an older source of alluvials over here. These are pre karoo to intra karoo sources sitting over here. And the Kimberlites themselves they, on the Craton range in age from the Kuruman bodies, somewhere around about 1700 million to just on the other side of the catchment, we have the Cullinan bodies at 1250. And, um, and from there, we move into the, to our younger intra karoo ages, the Joaneng Dokowaya ages, to 30 to 250 odd. And then we have the 
the group two pulse, which is about 150 to 110 odd in Southern Africa, and then followed by the, the very young, the late Cretaceous 85 to 90 pulse, in the, which really dominated the, the, the Kimberley area. And as I mentioned earlier, what's interesting is that our Namakula and Plaza has diamonds from the group two ages backwards, and the Spurkebeet has the, those as well as the Kimberley population very clearly in its in, in, entrenched in, in, in its uh, population over there. Right. So just a just a bit of a put it into a bit of a summary then. Here we've got a source, it's the Carfile Craton, pretty much. There's Kimberley over there. So the primary sources are giving us lower lower quality, lower gem percent qualities, maybe 15 to 20 percent total on, on the in their sources. Some of them a bit higher, like the cow cow mine and, and, and others running up to 60, 65%. But overall, you're looking at, at low gem quality in the source. You then have a fluvial conduit that takes it down to the coast. So there's a conveyor that strips this craton down to the coast, to the sink. By the time it gets down there, we're dealing with 95% gem quality. And what we find on, over here in the Spurker beat is that this terminal placer consists of mainly marine environments over here with a little bit of a twist to it and in this desert over here we also have an aeolian um, conduit a desert conduit that that reworks diamonds that were in place during various marine um, transgressions onto onto the coast over here so that's the that's the upgrade and the tail down to the coast and how do we know that there was a contribution from kimberley and that change well very clearly the kimberley Pool population has bigger stones. You know, it's we heard about the 616 character from Ray. And, um, and here are some classic Kimberley stones coming into the Vol River. And these are some of the classic Northwest, the Karoo Age Placer diamonds being reworked and mixed together in the Vol River system to be transported down to the, to the coast. So it's quite interesting. We're able to recognize these pebbles. Some of them, not all of them, obviously, but some of them in the in our uh, diamond populations on on the coast. So, how did this? What is what happened post this orogenic uplift somewhere around about the end of the Cretaceous, early tertiary? What is the record of this? And the real record is actually set in the terraces on the coastal plain to the west of the escarpment. This is a view into the into the. Um, Richter's Felt Escarpment, and this is the orange that's been branded, as I mentioned, superimposed river system, the big meander loops coming down the Sassendalins Drift, those people that know that part of the world. And what we notice is that the terraces on the Orange River young towards the current river. Lots of good work that's been done by Jürgen Jacob and other, his other co-workers there, but particularly Jürgen, JJ's uh, PhD thesis summarizes this very clearly. And what we know is that down on the coast, we have Eocene marine fossils, 42, 45 odd million years old, 42. And in the assemblage of these marine fossils, we have our interior polymictic class coming down from Luchtenberg, the Chalcedonies, from the Drakensberg agates, and from the Namacrometamorphic complex quartzes on the, on the fringe of the craton. And we're able to recognize this down in there. And not only that, we also recognize the stones that come down. And in the Eocene, we do find diamonds, this is actually an Eocene stone over here, just a carrot. And um, so we, we know that the stones come down and the early flush of the Eocene is very clearly finer grained, it's lower grade. And as we have the major incision taking place, coinciding with that Oligocene regression, that's when we see the main outfall and strip out of the interior diamonds onto the Namibian side of the coast of the uh, 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 offshore shelf. Now, the, the sources are confirmed by the heavy mineral studies that have been done by Nick Lancaster and Cliff Ollier back in the 80s, and then more recently by Albertina Nakasholi with her PhD, where they looked at the heavy mineral assemblages to see where, where they, how they matched the different pulses, but certainly the sources interior, craton, and uh, and on the Namacrobetamorphic belt as well, which is where you're seeing all these very nice garnets coming from. But the key for the Spurkevit Placer is the Cape Yellows from the Kimberley, uh, particularly Kimberley pool intrusions, those over 250 odd Kimberlites, I think John said on the, on the uh, Kimberley sheets, sheet 33. 
and certainly they've all been eroded and contributed to the to the west coast so it has a bit of a model developed by, by Brian Black, helping us to get some scientific rigor into our thinking and the exploration as we were thinking we were running out of land-based material after mining it for, since 1935 here. So we have the, the Orange River coming down. You have a longshore drift that is persistent and been going for at least the late Cretaceous. And certainly we see it in evidence in the, in the Eocene Aeolianites in, in the Spurgebiet. So it's the beginning of the Sand Sea. In the Eocene, and because of the aridity that starts about then as well, is that the coastal strip is able to absorb a lot of the sand from this longshore drift, leaving behind your gravels at the mouth of the orange and the mud going off into a shelf bypass system. But what's interesting about these gravels is that they are added to in the last 150 kilometers of the Orange River by that orogenic belt called the Richtersfeld, Dummer and Age, uh, uh, um, Pan African Age. Uh, orogenic belt and it's very steep and so it sheds coarse hard Nama quartzites so that uh, Cambrian age 500 odd million year Nama quartzites into the river system so this river as it hits the coastal plain here is now not just a mud charged river as we had in Quito Delta but as a gravel and in fact a cobble small boulder charged river outfall that then comes onto the coastal plain over here. And you've now got abrasive mechanisms to, to trap diamonds and to cut trap sites on the coastal plain. And it's the southerly wind system, which is absolutely imperative to understanding the, the, uh, why that delta is so coarse, why it's a, a wave dominated delta in the first place. It's a very persistent southerly wind system. And that just drives longshore drift to the north, takes away our sands and uh, helps concentrate uh, a, a wave dominated delta in the system. And there's another view of that wave dominated delta. It really is a highly energetic system. It's probably active like this 360 to th out of 365 days a year. And because of that, the outfall that has come down here um, gets rapidly redistributed up the coast. And a good a modern example of this is in 1988 when the Orange River had the 8,000 cubic flood, came down and pumped out a bit of a the delta here, this hardly lasted six months, and that southerly wind had made sure that it chomped it away, shoved it back into a, a barrier complex into the Orange River mouth, and the rest of it being transported up the coast. So what we see then, from away from the outfall of the Orange River, is we see a, a hierarchy of beaches, marine deposits that are developed. In the mouth itself, we have accommodation space, we have barrier beach passes developed. These were studied and well documented by uh, Spags Pajori in his PhD. And um, it's really interesting because fairly low grade deposits, but big stone size, because you're right at the mouth of the outfall. And that's what makes the Orange River different. The biggest stone, as Ian Corbett pointed out, is 246 carat on the Namibian side. On the Alexander Bay side, it's 211 carat. And both of them were classic octas from the Kimberley pool area. And most of the big stones that we find down here, the plus 100 characters, and they, they are here, there over, must be over 80 or over 100 that have been recovered now. They, they, they are predominantly um, Kimberley Pool uh, type, type 1 octaves and dodex that have made it to the coast. Anyway, back to the beaches though. So what happens is as one moves away from the accommodation space of the Orange River mouth, you then end up with a, with a Pan-African bedrock footwall, which is cliffed. And for about 100 kilometers, we get what we call linear beaches developed against a cliff. And these were really the mainstay of the production. The beaches themselves produced over 50 million carats on the onshore beaches. So they in themselves were a mega placid without adding to the barrier beaches. And further north, as you run out of sediment, you go into the pocket beach places and, and that form between headlands as you go up the coast. Now this system, just to give you an idea of scale, the linear beaches are over 100 kilometers long, about 110, about 100 k's long. The pocket beaches then run for another 200 kilometers up the coast. So we're looking at a, at a big system here. And uh, let's have a quick look at, so that's on the onshore that we can see and make no mistake, sea level's been up, sea level's been down. We won't use the famous saying of the draws, how many times it goes up and down, but that's how it is. So we have submarine beach passes as well. These have been recognized and probably one of the, the best ones is the one that Ian Corbett showed us, the minus 20 meter cliff line, which you can 
trace all the way from the Macroland up to Miog Bay in uh, central central Namibia. So it really is. We've got submarine beach passes as well, cliff lines, beaches, and um, and that's fairly important in terms of the, in terms of the offshore targets. So the the beach is, itself is uh, this is the we don't have too many gravel beaches in Namibia, but this is up the skeleton coast with the where the Unyab River debouches out and gives us a nice modern example to go and have a look at in a high energy coastline. So what do we have? We have a classic intertidal deposits, beach crest, your shore face deposits down to the to the beach toe, and then onto a wave cut platform out here. So that's what we see. These are the subtidal deposits down here. There are intertidal deposits. And then when you've got accommodation space, you don't have a cliff there, or you've got some other, you can have washover deposits into lagoon at, at the back. So fairly classic sort of beach type profile that is down there. And um, this is the work that Spags did in his, in his uh, PhD, where he, he basically showed very clearly the subtidal zone has big stones, not quite the same concentration, but, but the big stones are out there on your wave cut platform and at the beach toe itself. Being, it's really a jigging system. That's what the beaches are. And in the inter intertidal zone, we have high concentration of stones, not quite the same stone size, but certainly um, the concentration is up in this jigging, this natural jigging mechanism, passiforming mechanism between the beach crest and the beach toe down the bottom. And then if you get some back, back barrier areas, the stone size tends to be small, flicked over because most of the big stones it hooked up on the crest anyway, and your diamond grade, that's variable, but can be can be better than your, your subtitle zone on the on the on the platform. And that's really what has what, is, what is made this Spurkovic placer because you've the Orange River has been coming down, bringing gravel since at least 40 million years. That southerly windrift system has been active since then, and you've had the segregation in a shallow shelf breaking of that shelf, breaking of the, of the outfalls and various outfalls and various pulses into beaches of various ages. And here's just a, an example of, of what that platform looks like. It's a wave cut platform. It's being intensely mined at the moment. There's a seawall over here. And as Ian pointed out, to work down below minus 20 meters with that mighty Atlantic looking over, over you or peeping over at you is, uh, is pretty... Uh, pretty uh, uh, impressive and uh, certainly the uh, NAMDEV team has got this down to quite a fine art these days. There are odd occasional breaches in the very big storms but by and large for decades they've been mining the below sea level along the coast of, of uh, the Spurkebeet. And here are some of the gullies, a very good work that was done by Janet Jacob and her masters and the subsequent publications and you can see the depth of these gullies. So there's a nice wave cut platform what happens is the sea comes in, beats up, the, cuts the platform, and then using those normal quartzites in particular, it just, you get swash gullies, you get all sorts of, you get different types of gullies, strike gullies, depending on your bedrock, but effectively, it doesn't worry. And when you've got lots of material to cut the, the platforms and to cut gullies for you, it just goes right across bedrock structure and strike. Okay, so in, <clears throat> they've done some very good work in recent years on this. Uh, Jana and, and uh, Lynette Kirkpatrick, and they've uh, taken what they've learned on the onshore and using MAG and, and some very clever statistics on gully patterns, they're predicting to push, to predicting what can happen below sea levels to help with the building of the sea walls. And because uh, obviously it's an expensive process, you want to be as accurate as possible to get out there. But the final, the final cleanup, doesn't matter whether you're minus 20 meters or whether you're even plus 30 meters above sea level, the final cleanup on your gullies, which can, can have, you know, grades of up to a couple of hundred carats per hundred ton, 95% gem quality, it's quite a good place to be. But your final cleanup is with a big hoover, you suck it up with a, what you call the transvac system, and you, they, um, you folk get down, they strip the overburden off to bedrock peaks. Most of the gravel sit below bedrock peak in these gullies, and if you're lucky enough, you'll get to see a stone. It's 1.8 carat mackerel then, sitting in, in the, in the uh, in the bedrock gravels. And these, these gravels were, were very impressive. As you went up the coast and you ran out of the normal quartzites, so at about 50, 60 kilometers away from the mouth, you actually had the peak of the grades. 
the grades were peaked because it weren't diluted with the bigger gravels and you were, were having more and more diamonds sorted, basically jigged along the coast. So much so that uh, in the mid 1970s, most of management had to go and do the bedrock cleaning and cleaning out of the gullies up there because the, uh, they used to pay a, a pickup system. And most of the bedrock cleaners, sweepers as they're called, were lining up to get the, claim their awards because there are so many stocks. That's a bit of history. And okay, so I think coming back to, to the coastline itself, so our linear beaches were really the were really a mega placer in themselves. As we go north into the into the pocket beaches, these get, get smaller. And you, you with the longshore drift, you get a log spiral bay, J Bay is formed, as well as uh, pocket beaches between headlands. The what the J Bays do for us though is that they actually take the sand out of the system and put it onshore in these Aeolian transport corridors that were described by Ian Corbett in his thesis back in the 1980s. And um, so again, this is a very good overburden removal system that gets rid of your, 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 your sands out of there. And a spectacular example is in the, is of the deflation places in the middle part of the Spurgebiet, where um, Ian has mentioned this, the August Stauch and, and uh, Prof Scheiber and those 1910 odd days came down. And in the Ida Toll itself, Ida Toll, Martian Toll to the west over here, they claimed they were able to differentiate the diamonds by moonlight. And that's because these deflation places are reworked, early, are reworked marine deposits, higher marine deposits. They've been caught up in endorheic basins and a combination of salt weathering and the really abrasive strong wind action upgrades these, um, these little endorheic basins into deflation places. And in this particular one, there was a million carrots lying down there mined about seven times, believe it or not, it was only 10 centimeters thick. So it really was, uh, it's a very, very special, unique passer that we don't find anywhere else so far in, in the world. And uh, this is the Hex and Kessel area that Ian uh, spoke about as well. So very, very rich places, thin, tiny places, but that's where, where they were. As we go further north along the, the longshore drift to wind system, so the sand starts to catch up with you. So you, you deplete it further down. It starts to accumulate in the main arm of Sand Sea. And we actually have at Elizabeth Bay, he has a classic pocket beach, a very big, in fact, it is the biggest pocket beach on the West Coast. And uh, we have Aeolian Placids. And in actual fact, it was an Aeolian Placid that really led to the discovery of the Spurkebeet main Placid in the first place. He has an Aeolian Mega Ripple. These are 75 to 1.2 meters, 75 centimeters to 1.2 meter high, mega, bigger coarse sand to small grit, I mean to grit, that's two to four mil, to small pebble size of materi material that's actually windblown. And these Aeolian bed forms are modern. They were encroaching over the railway line between Luderitz and, and Aus. And uh, that's where uh, Zachariah Lewala found the first stones. So he recognized those diamonds, they were tiny. These are them here on the right-hand side. This is the grit equivalent. And what's interesting is that that same signature that we see in the Orange River in the class, we see down at the grit size up here in the Ludritz area, some 300, 400, 300 uh, kilometers away from the mouth of the Orange River. So this is the, um, about the only hydrodynamic real placer. In other words, the diamonds here are in uh, hydraulic equivalents of the grits and small pebbles that they are found here. When the wind blows here in a big blow, you can catch four millimeter grit at two meters high. And a caravan can be sandblasted in half a day. The side of a caravan can be sandblasted. You lose your headlights also in one of these windstorms. It's really very, very vicious when you see a, a southerly blow come into action over here. And it's that northward movement, onward, incessant northward movement that's so important for making the Spurkebeet pass it. from the gravels in the south down here at the Orange River. This is a satellite view looking south from the Orange River coming up. You see no sands over there, hit Luderitz, and there we get the main arm of Sand Sea forming. So as John Rogers pointed out in 1977, the main arm of Sand Sea is nothing more than the displaced delta of the Orange River by the action of the southerly winds and onshore drift. So our main class of development is really in this 300 odd kilometers away from the mouth of the Orange River, and of course offshore in the Atlantic One area that Urban is going to talk about later. Just a, a brief 
summary on the on the Narmut Sand Sea. It's only 34,000 square kilometers in current form, but it has all the main dune types that you can find in the world. Barkin dunes along the coast, unidirectional wind systems, crescentic also, unidirectional. And as you move across here, so you get an, an interplay of unidirectional, the southerly wind and the easterly wind coming in, the Katabati, the um, Berg winds, the east winds driven by the by the cold interior in, in winter months, and you get star dunes as well. So really fantastic geological story of a conveyor, orange river fluvial conveyor, coming down, hitting a marine conveyor, ending up in an Aeolian conveyor over here, and leaving us with the most magnificent megaplaster, which has provided the model for our cartoon against which we can measure megaplasters in the world. So, so <clears throat> what, what does reflect that move away from the Orange River under the longshore drift and southerly wind system is clearly the average carrots per stone, the stone size going up the coast. And what's interesting is that unusually so and very different to Namakwa land is that we have coarse diamonds at the mouth of the Orange, and that's because they main uplift. That late Cretaceous, early tertiary uplift gave an impetus to the Orange River, which was able to strip out the interior of South Africa from about 40 odd million years all the way through to today. And as the terraces developed and as the history of the, or as the orange has, has evolved, so we've gone from, from a, a fine grained outfall in the Eocene through coarse grained in the Oligocene to a maximum coarse grained in the Playa Pleistocene down, down, the, down the orange itself. And once you hit, hit the sea, then going up the coast, so the, so the, the stone size just really does move away. But what's interesting is when you look at, at uh, the Elizabeth Bay area and down Bogenfels over here, what's interesting is to see the dichotomy between the offshore results and the onshore results. And this is because these results here reflect the early emplacement of that Eocene shoreline, the 170 meter shoreline. There's a small stone sitting here giving us a 0.1 stone size average roughly in the Ludwitz area, whereas if you go offshore with the younger input and the longshore drift there, we see quarter carat average stone size in this part of the world. So that's quite an interesting sort of 300 kilometer long move. And it doesn't just stop here. It goes all the way up, as I say, about a thousand kilometers to, to Terrace Bay in the Skeleton Coast. So here's some examples of the lower Orange River diamonds. And uh, these are 50 carat, 25 carat, 26 carat over there. And that's what you're looking at, all gem quality. By the time you get up to Elizabeth Bay in this part of the world, also, 95 plus gem quality and superb small stones. But your average stone size up here, your maximum stone size in this part of the world will be a 5.7 character. The maximum stone size at the outfall, as you heard from me, 246 in Namibia and 211 at Alexander Bay. Right. <clears throat> so, just sort of wrapping up then, you know, the, the west coast of, of, of Southern Africa has really given us the opportunity to build an understanding and a model for what we believe a, an diamond mega placer should be. And it really reinforces those points that we had earlier on. That is, your littoral terminal placer is your, gives you your best opportunity to develop a mega placer in actual fact. Your interior ones too close to source, not enough time to jack up your gem quality. Your transient placers tend to be a little bit thin and in a hurry to get to the sea, as it were, or to get to the low elevations. And when you get down onto the coast, and that outfall gets, and gets taken on by the sea and by the marine action inside there, and the marine processes that never stop. They just keep going, whether you're dealing with the low stand in the, in the glacial periods, or whether you're dealing with a high stand in the interglacial periods, that sea action just keeps on moving. And if you've got a nice microtidal range, focuses your wave energy within two meter range and every now and again up to six meters with the big storms and you've got a littoral drift that takes away your overburden then you're heading for for making yourself a decent a decent placer which I think is what the, the Spurgebiet certainly does it really is the top of the placer and I think at top of the placer league and um, it certainly fulfills the the uh, the characteristics and actually helped helped us develop the mega placer model so thank you very much. That's me. Thank you so much, John. This was so interesting. And um, yeah, uh, 
time uh, is never standing still, so uh, any questions? <laughs> are, you passing, are you passing around the glasses of wine, okay? I'm still opening the bottle, but we'll do now. <laughs> <laughs> you knew you'd after today's long sessions, yeah. <laughs> okay, well done to everyone that made a sterling effort and for all of those that are still on online. Fantastic. Thanks, John. That was excellent. Okay, who's going to kick off the questions? London? Are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, John, yeah, I, I always wondered what, uh, I mean, that the uh, macro population always bothered me that there, there is no big stones in it. Or it, it yeah. It's quite smaller than the, than the, uh, the Spergebiet one. Uh, and uh, a very good explanation. And, and I agree. I think there's, uh, what, you, what you're saying is makes a lot of sense. Just tell me, where do you, what do you think the source is of the diamonds of the macro land? Do you think it's, it's, it's possibly mainly the Dwaika higher up? Uh, no. What's your what's your thoughts? No, I really think it's a, it's the it's the, it's the group twos in the intra Karoos. You know, if you have a look at Dokawaya sitting out there in Swaziland, three hundred odd million, you got Chwaneng at two forty. We don't have a hell of a lot of intra Karoo eh, left in our country. If you think about it, so where do those stones go? And also the group twos. The group twos, are, you know, you know, if you think of stars, you know, those those dikes, eh, they were feeding some pups. Those pups are gone. Eh? Yeah, and they, and they were good stones. They were really top quality stones. So I think I think I don't think the Dwyker. I'm I'm a bit like you. The Dwyker is a contributor. I don't think yeah. there's any, I don't think there's any doubt that it's a contributor along the way, and it's going to be a, a ramshackle one. You know, unless yeah. you put something over it and clean it up like it's done in in Bushy in Piers Place there. You know, in the northwest, you can still clean it up a little bit there. But but when you clean that up, you can clean it up to half a CPHT. But down there in the back land, ish, you've got lots of small stones. They're well sorted. You're coming down a big, a, 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 a fluvial system that was deeper grain than the, than the Kudu Delta because it was giving you a sand delta. So it yeah. was enough, good enough for that, you know. And we saw that on the Kasai, actually. That Kasai in the Congo really sorted out the grits and the small pebbles into, into pulses of sediment that look very similar to the bird sea gravel that the guys... You know, we spoke about that many decades ago. We never really resolved it, but I think it's a lot of it is the, is the Karoo. It's a stripping of the Karoo. And as Bill said last week as well, he said, there's a hell of a Karoo cover that we had to get rid of. That. And you showed that in your cross-section. You had to get rid of that Karoo cover. And we yeah. know that we get rid of it between Finch and Kimberley. So on those, you know, that 85 to 118, 120, whatever it is, you know, you've got to get rid of it there. And the bulk of that goes down goes down down that side and only only a bit later to the to the uh, to the kudu delta so i think it's okay. a group isn't it? and the, and the, and the intra karoos that we're really looking at there and although although the ages show these cullen and type age is pre karoo you know the venetia ages are there so there's obviously you know there's definitely a, a dwyker input but whether it's, it's i don't think it's the main the main supply to a well sorted small population Okay, yeah, thanks. I mean, just to come in there, I don't think anyone's ever said that the Dwyko was that, you know, the sole contributor, probably quite the contrary. Um, and, and, and I think just one other, you know, caution we, we need to just um, bear in mind, and, and I've certainly had the discussion with Mike and others, um, you know, a lot of those early diamond ages were on small diamonds and typically composites. And, and I'm not saying that's bad, but what, and be interested to hear Andy's view, Andy Moore, if he's still on what we really need to be doing. And of course that, you know, that, that becomes a difficulty because of the, the cost of the bigger diamonds. We need, we need individual inclusions from bigger diamonds um, to, you know, also relook at some of these, um, these, these bits of data. And, and we see it already in the dating of diamonds with, the, with the, the modern techniques where you can, you know, drill a hole in a single inclusion and, and date them rather than compositing them. You know, we're now starting to see that, you know, diamond ages are showing a far greater spread than we originally thought. So, you know, there's, it, it all goes back to the technology, the technology is evolving as well. And, and I agree, I agree with John, sorry, just to finish that, you know, the, the Dwyker was a, a disaggregator and a transporter. It wasn't wasn't necessarily a, a you know a concentrator. I don't think that's been said at all. 
he kept in some of those yes because it like bobbed in Luchtenberg, of course. Yeah. John Lin Linden showed that cross section of the Karoo, which I assume was east west, right? Yeah. So I guess the would have the expectation would be that the um, that the escarpment would be moving backwards. Now I've seen a paper that Jock and others did. I'm not sure if Andy was involved in it as well, where they measured the, um, the position of the escarpment at, at different periods. Now, if you, we, I think we, um, the basalt must have been much more ex extensive than it is now. So where would you have, you know, would, would the Orange River um, catchment have extended into the free state on the basalts. Yep. Given that any thought. Yeah, yeah, well, it certainly did because at the time of the uplift, the first, the first siliceous class that come down are Drakensberg agates, Lichtenberg, Chalcedonies, and those red cornelians, which and chrysoprase, which only comes from that part of the whole catchment. We've been over the whole catchment. So they're the first stones that hit the coast. Huh? So that 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 uh, Kudu Delta. Mm -hmm drainage was well established right back into the into the hinterland. Coming to the escarpment, though, one of the things that, that we've been working on for a while, and it's one of the papers I owe Mike here, is, is, is on the pre karoo surface. And what we found in actual fact in, in the Macoland, and just now in May on a trip that I did with, with Roger mm -hmm. up in Central Norman, the escarpment is actually which is, is a pre karoo feature. It's clearly defined in the, in the coca field. That was well understood yeah. by Homer Martin and Carl Schulte back in the 1950s already. But to the central Narmuk and the southern Narmuk, it was always a little bit uncertain. And we've now confirmed that, um, and, and in fact, there's Dwyker on the coastal plain of Port Nollet, inland from Port Nollet. So that escarpment is actually a pre karoo exhumed feature, Bill. Yeah, oh, you, you, you see a, a similar thing on the eastern side as well with the, um, um, you know, the the so-called Drakensberg, the northern Drakensberg around um, uh, Zanin and those areas. I mean, that part of the escarpment must be, that's a pre crew feature. I agree, Bill. No, no, it's much more extensive than we realise. Yeah. But Bob Surface paper that we presented at Roy Miller's Symposium in 2014 is the one that I still haven't written up, and uh, and that really it goes right across into Zimbabwe. You're quite right. It's much yeah. more inclusive than, than we give credit for, and so there's been. Then, then, you're, then you're filling the interior with um, not only lava but Stormberg and all the other all the other sedimentary sequences, and you know most of the most of the Transvaal as it then was is is pre karoo landscape. Certainly, everything north, virtually north of the Vaal River. Yep, absolutely. Three to four down north. Yeah. Can I quickly interrupt? I saw a hand from Katani. Paul well, and John. I think I think um, yeah. one about the um, you know the the drainage pattern that existed at that time <coughs> because you, you you're going through basalts that would have, would have been, you know, probably quite weathered. Um, and if it's quite fast stripping, then, you know, those drainages would have ingrained pretty quickly and then really got moving. Yep. It's soft cover. You, you, I agree with you, but it's certainly not the, not the Drakensberg we know today, which is a, a, you know, a rugged massif as it were. Yeah. But then the, um, then, then the only, thing that I, you know, the only concern I have is that then, you know, that, that is fine sediment you're creating out, out of the basalts and not sandy sediment. Now, if you, if you have a look at, if the basalt is thinning westwards away from the main outfall centers, as, as it may well have been to lap, on La Ponte, Spesberger, you know, Finch, thinking more of Finch area actually, then, then you very quickly get into the Aeolian sandstones underneath it. And um, and yeah. which is effectively yeah. Clarence, your Clarence and the red beds, and then and then into the upper Beaufort, and and that's although all those sheds are in in the group twos, 
Kimberlites, but they're not in the group ones. Eh? They all have, they see, some of the Beaufort is in the group ones, but, but not the basalt. Eh? Until mm -hmm. you go towards coffee, um, you know, cold filet, coffee, um, jagger side, then, you, then, you, then that's when you start to peel back the, the basalt um, escarpment, I think. Because cold filet has got, got lots of basalt in it. It looks like there's, there's about a K, uh, about 500, sorry, about 500 meters come off cold filet. If I look at the uh, uh, um, Clarion sandstone in there and the basalt. Yeah, and, I mean, Finch, Finch had a lot of basalt in it as well, John. Yep, absolutely, because group two, huh? and that's why the group one is, that's why Carl Filet is interesting, John, because that then kicks off the Carl Filet coffee jaggers pushback. Yeah. And that's where, that's where us, some of us, he's, Start, uh, work they did on the diamonds is probably well worth revisiting actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we need some more um, bigger diamonds from from the west coast, the Macquarland as well. And um, uh, we gave Dave two from 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 the northwest, man. One seven point nine character with two CPX inclusions in it, and something mm -hmm. went wrong. We couldn't get anything out of that. And there was another one that cost me bloody five hundred dollars. They didn't buy it, and. Uh, and we got a two, 240 age out of that one, uh, Bill. But, I mean, uh, uh, John, but I, I need to get Dave to, to confirm that. Well, well, that came from John Ng. I mean, that's spot on. Yeah, that's spot on, yeah. yeah John, uh, I'm going to just chip in here. Can I share that yeah, paper please. that, uh, that, that uh, Dave Phillips did publish? Yeah. yeah. Um, because it, it totally backs up your, your group two um, story. The point about the work that Dave Phillips did is he worked exclusively on planoparoxene inclusions because it gives you a real date or very yeah. close to a real date for the, for, for the diamond or the eruption age of the diamond. And he used argon-argon, which not many people use in this space. So he's a, he's a specialist in that. And then if you look at his results, uh, which are uh, a bit further down, let me just uh, uh, scroll through there. Lots of data. It's a unique study. And this is for Namakulan diamonds. Okay, this is not for Orange River, uh, not for um, the Spargabit uh, Plaza. This is for the Namakulan um, uh, diamonds. There you can see all these ages that he's getting in two different styles of determining the ages. They don't overlap with young Kimberlites. They overlap with orangeites, which we're, we're calling the group twos, and then slightly uh, slightly older. And there's just a sniff of Dwyka ages. Um, in this in this style of dating, it totally overlaps with uh, with the group twos. And the fact that you get slightly older ages is consistent with the way that dating technique actually works. You get slightly, you get excess argon occasionally. Uh, and so your story is completely supported by this uh, this piece of work. Oh, well, thanks very much, Evan. That's appreciated. And and I mean, John, just to take that a step further, where did that Southern River, um, you know, go through through um, through Namakwiland and through the pans that we still see? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, that Poslo's pan. And Mike's Suck River, what's a brand fly? Van Vake's yeah. fly, all those funny little stones that he picked up. They've been redistributed, John, but they, yeah. they are the legacy of that Karoo River. And, uh, and you know, the trouble is, the guys look at Boslow's pan because they might have seen fossils in it. They say, oh, shit, it's bloody, you know, it's got nothing to do with the Karoo River. No, that current deposit hasn't, but the stones have. And if you take the gap, there's a gap between Cummings Crew and Van Ryan's Dorp, you know, in the Cape Fall Belt. There's a gap. There's a gap that, where the Dwyer actually makes the makes the escarpment near you know, mm. That's and that's pretty much opposite the Canoe's flux. And when you and if you look at Horton's, there's a I've got to find the, the the reference for Mike. But Horton referred to an Eocene fossil, marine fossil, found to the north of Van Ryan's door. We tried to find it back in the day, but we never did. But Richard Hall found some very interesting quartz. Um, well-rounded gravels sitting in the middle of the bloody Knurse Flakta that he could never explain. I think the 570 meter plate Cretaceous explains it. So, so that, that's something else I think we need to, to target a bit more, you know, John, and have a look at that. 
and um, and and see see what it is because in parts of Angola you can just see that shoreline only on a lag of gravel, huh? and then you get to the the dateable deposits. I mean, lucky there's still the dateable deposits. Here. If, if ever Halpitz gets gets going again and gets mined out, you know, in the Cow River Valley, I mean, someone needs to go and get some diamonds out of that source as well. Yep, no, a little bit sandy, a little bit sand covered there, but yeah, Halpitz, Bosla, that's just redistributing this. I think it's because a lot of those stones, if I remember rightly, the late Derek Robinson looked at those, and they were brown stones, they were old stones. So there was definitely a, you know, an older contribution, you know. Probably from the Dwyker because the Dwyker is pretty much exposed there, John. You know, yeah. it's that main pulse, it's that pulse of clean small stones. I mean, Konyos has some of the best sorted, I think, diamonds in Africa sitting in that 0.21 um, SFD. You know, if you go speak to Paddy Lawless and those guys, you know, they, those are pretty steep SFDs that came out of Konyos. So. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it goes back to, I guess, effectively the whole, you know, Namaquila and West Coast um, population. If you you know, if you work all the way down the coast from Alex Bay. Yep. Oh, you run out of the, you run out of the, the signature 20K south, the orange river signature 20K south, and then you're back into the Macaland population. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking south, southern stuff. Yeah. Oh, so southern south. Oh, okay. Okay, and and I, and I think um, and we've we've talked about it, and Bill has raised it several times. I mean, someone needs to. We need need some smart young students and all this GIS technology, and do a um, you know a very detailed geomorphological study, you know, across across probably from the Orange River mouth to I don't know what it's going to be the, the Mbalusi or the other side of the country, you know, and do slices down the. Down, down sort of to the south and to the north um you know for for a, a detailed geomorphological study looking at all these you know new sets of data that now exist and and also fit in fit in the kimberlites and how they you know how those kimberlite models relate with you know no, no disrespect to barry hawthorne and everyone else and john gurney that did the you know the kimberlite model and then counted all the kimberlites and worked out the volume of diamonds that went down to the west coast that you know it's time to redo that study i agree with you there john because it's definitely knowing you the 1.5 eh? yeah no. yeah but i think we could also look at different time slices you know which kimberlite exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would be good bill john says the group the the group ones one there in the early stages um, interestingly, Juaneng would have still been covered. It must have been covered by basalt. Yeah, two forty. Yeah, it would have been would have yeah. been covered by the Karoo basalt. Yeah. yeah. But your Karoo basalt is a thin and botswana, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's all relative. All relative. Yeah, but, but still covered. But I agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 